Hello, you're listening to the Northern Agenda podcast, your weekly dose of politics that's from the north of England and for the north of England. I'm Rob Parsons, a political journalist based in Leeds, who reports on our proud region's MPs, mayors, councils and more, and I write it all up for an email newsletter called The Northern Agenda, which drops into your inbox around midday every weekday. Normally, I use this weekly podcast to dive into a big political issue in the North, but shall we do something different this week? I think we should. One of my favourite bits of my working week is every Wednesday around two o'clock when I get together online with the award-winning cartoonist Graham Bandera to work out what our Friday satirical cartoon is going to be in the Northern Agenda. I would have to say there's been some crackers in the last year. Environment Secretary Therese Coffey dancing down Red Beach surrounded by dead crabs. Nadine Dorries throwing her toys out of the pram after not getting a peerage. And Michael Gove and Mishy Sunak stripping down to the bare essentials as they reenacted the full Monty in Sheffield. So I thought it would be fun to lift the lid on how our cartoon conference goes each week by recording it for this podcast. And you can check out the finished cartoon on Friday lunchtime in the newsletter. So, Graham, welcome back to the podcast. How are things? Cheers, Rob. All good, mate. Ready to go again. Soon comes around, doesn't it, each week? It does. It does. It's a highlight of every week. Now, I'm sure you're too modest to mention it, but you were recently named runner-up at the Political Cartoon of the Year Awards in London, and you were handed the award by uh, a famous political figure. Just tell us about that. Well, that was bizarre, really, because it was... Yeah, I came runner-up uh, with for my Nadine Dorries missing person cartoon, which was which was quite nice, um, and it was Suella Braverman who was presenting the award. Um, and the irony behind that is I've been basically absolutely torturing her for the last three or four weeks with 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 satirical cartoons. But to be fair to her, they they, they know the drill. Um, quite thick skinned, and uh, she was quite quite self deprecating to be honest. So I don't think she was too phased by any of it and um, there was quite a lot of heckling um but myself I, I kept tried to keep it professional yeah she got into a row didn't she with uh with a journalist in the in the audience or something i, I recall it was uh rebecca hendon uh political cartoonist she was quite vocal in her views towards her political beliefs and sorella braverman offered her to come up on stage and, and challenge her um at which that point the organizer of the event thought it best to intervene because it looked like it might have got got out of hand. Um, so I think it was the right decision, um, and then it was quickly quickly diffused. But you know, when she's fronting up for an event like that, um, I believe she wasn't paid for it. She she turned up, probably a bit of a charm offensive to make her look a little bit more in tune with the general public. But uh, it it reflected badly on on the artist. I would I would I said to be honest. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm I'm really thrilled to have a special guest to help us come up with this week's cartoon, none other than Matt Chorley, one of the country's very top political journalists, a presenter on Times Radio, which includes a podcast called Politics Without the Boring Bits, and a comedian whose show about politics is touring next month and includes some dates in the north of England. Um, Matt, welcome to the podcast. Um, Now, you're fresh from finishing your daily Three hour show. Um, how did it? How did it go today? Were any any particular any particular quirky highlights that stood out, stood out for you? Yeah, it was quite a mixed bag. Uh, so there was obviously your appearance. That was probably a highlight. Well, um, I was too modest to too modest to mention <laughs> that. But yes, yeah. no, I knew what you were, I knew what you were fishing for. Um, uh, so yeah, we do a thing called Dish United Kingdom every Wednesday, where we speak to a journal, journalist, political journalist in England, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, to sort of talk about the stories that might not be being covered. A lot elsewhere. It's a good antidote to then doing PMQs at midday, which is the most Westminster bubble um, story around, uh, which is probably the case uh, again uh, this week. But then in and around that, we had... um, uh, Well, in fact, you bought the... uh... Yeah, I'll tell you. Yeah, so I found a great story in the Manchester Evening News uh, about a hypnotist who wants to play a show in Bolton at the Albert Halls this Saturday, but he uh, is uh, uh, been. It's going to be hard for him to do so because of a piece of legislation called the 1952 Hypnosis Act, which uh, bars hypnotists from playing unless they have a license. But it only applies to certain bits of the country. Only certain councils choose to enforce this legislation, and Bolton 
in Greater Manchester is one of them. And so uh, this chap, Robert Temple, I think his name is, is going to have to uh, persuade local councillors at Bolton why his hypnosis show, which I think is called Red Raw, uh, is okay to be performed in front of the good people of Bolton on Saturday night, which uh, I thought was a nice, a nice quirky story. It was a great story. So, and actually, I liked it so much. We managed to track him down, and we got him on the show just before the end of the show. Oh, did you? Oh, did you? What, and what did he say? He, he he explained the story as you just did, and I said, "Well, can't you just hypnotise the councillors into giving you per- permission?" But he suggested that 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 wouldn't work. I don't know because hypnotising an entire council chamber was too complicated, or you know, he only just specialises in hypnotising people so they cluck like chickens rather than overturn 50 year old pieces of legislation but yeah so it was yeah so he's gonna and he's gonna come back to us because he's at the council tonight so he's gonna come back to us and we'll find out what happens oh amazing well that's uh that, that's live news happening on on times radio now um i wanted to um just sort of go ask more generally because obviously you you have a podcast called politics without the boring bits and you're going on tour um with uh yeah, you know, your comedy show sort of poking fun at politics and politicians. So how do you go about trying to make politics funny? Um, is it an easy task? Like, what do you, do you try and pick and choose particular subjects? Or, like, what, what's your approach to it? Well, Gra- Graham would probably agree with me on this. I mean, to some extent, it's, it's, be- it's become easier because of the way that politicians have behaved in the last uh, two or three years, certainly. Um, so on the one hand, you sort of think, well, they keep doing and saying mad stuff, which sort of makes it. I mean, it, I do it. I genuinely. I, I've been a political journalist for like nearly twenty years now, and I basically I do think politics is important, and I think people. I really hate when people say, "Oh, it's not for me," or "Oh, I don't. Fo- oh, I don't follow politics." Like they don't follow. I don't know Formula One. Um, like everyone should follow. You know, should be aware of what's going on in the world and who's you know deciding how to run the country and all that sort of stuff. Um, and I think one way of doing that is to be slightly more entertaining with it and hook people in with humour and then hopefully they learn stuff. So our, my show is both simultaneously, hopefully, you know, at its best, we'll have a laugh and maybe take the mic or find some humour in something that's happened. But then it's also quite nerdy. And so you can go quite quickly from what seemed like quite a light treatment or something into something, you know, you suddenly are finding out the difference between, what do we do this week? The difference between uh, A.V. Dicey and... Erskine May in a competition who of who was the best constitutional theorist. So, you know, we've got the full waterfront covered. So on the one hand, politicians lately have been uh, making my life easier. By lately, I mean probably the last two or three years. Um, however, and Graham might, might agree with me on this, the problem is that anyone can do a Boris Johnson joke. Anyone can do a Donald Trump joke. Like my gran could do a, you know, would make a Donald Trump joke or Boris Johnson or his niece Scruffy or Liz Truss or she's a lettuce. And so I think then you have to just work harder to go beyond that and to find the surprising. And so it's sort of finding the sweet spot. Some people do just want you to be rude about Boris Johnson the whole time. But actually, it's quite boring uh, to do. And for the audience, I think. I don't know what you think, Graham. I think you're spot on there, Matt. Um I'd, I'd put politics in the same bracket as talking about the weather and, and, and sport or football. It's there to be sort of delved into, really, and you can dig as, as deep as you possibly can. And if you're talking about, uh, you know, stories of comedy or characters of particular comedy, then you can sort of exaggerate them to, you know, beyond belief. Like you mentioned about Boris, Trump. Yep, yeah, they are very cliched characters. But if you delve even deeper, you can find more about them. And there's always another character around the corner. Um, that's the beauty of politics. Somebody goes and somebody comes in. It's a it's a constant revolving door. And not just with prime ministers, with home secretaries, foreign secretaries, health secretaries. So you can you can you can stretch them boundaries to as as far as you want, really. Um, and it's the further you go, the more risky you can become, I, I believe. And I think it's uh, it's brilliant to be able to do that. Yeah. And the um, I mean, maybe that's a good point to talk about your process, Graham, for coming up with Cartoon. Because I, I, mean, I was thinking about sort of how we go about doing it each week. And generally, we try and find a story in the news that is has some potential to be uh, shown in a different way or like put into a different situation that kind of exposes a humorous aspect to it or exposes 
a fundamental truth about it. And ideally, it will be something that relates to uh, to the North. Like, I mean, for example, last week we did uh, the Teesworks uh, saga, didn't we? The whole uh, big row over the um, big regeneration site in, uh, in, in Teesside and the allegations of corruption and how it's being run and so forth. And I mean, maybe just take us through how you uh how how you went about doing that particular cartoon or like your process in, in in general for these these things well once once one cartoon's finished you, you're basically onto the second one straight away and you just got to be be observant um i think good observation of uh newsworthy topics is essential so you've got to be abreast with with social media what's breaking news and then just jot things down as the week goes by and then once you've got a, a collection of thoughts, that's when we, we get together, you and I, Rob, and we generally sort of meet in the middle, don't we? We generally find that we we're, we have an interest in the same sort of topics, which could which could provoke a bit of you know interrogation um, and, and comedy. Once we've picked out that sort of particular populist topic, um, it's sometimes good to try and merge two topics. So say there's a, a big film premiere coming or a sporting event or an anniversary of something it's nice to tie them both in it just gives the the uh the story of the cartoon a different twist rather than like what we were saying before matt just doing a funny donald trump cartoon or a funny boris johnson cartoon there's so many of them they just become stale so you've got to try and put a little bit of a twist on it uh hence some ideas for for this week um because well, it's been a pretty dull week politics wise hasn't it <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we'll come to this this week's cartoons uh, shortly. But uh, the other thing I was going to ask you, Matt, because actually with PMQs, uh, which was happened a couple of hours ago, featured at what some people might consider a, a poorly executed attempt at comedy from our prime minister, uh, where he, I mean, some might argue it wasn't even a joke at all, but during PMQs, Rishi Sunak made a jibe at, um, at Keir Starmer, and the uh, his, his U-turns in recent months. And he made reference to um, how Keir Starmer defines a woman and saying that is 99% of a U-turn. And uh, I'm fairly sure that Rishi Sunak didn't know that the mother of Brianna Jai, uh, Esther Jai, was in the Commons chamber listening to this. And so it prompted a bit of a backlash about uh, how tasteless it was to make what was perceived as a transgender joke with Brianna's mum uh, in 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 the audio, in 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 the chamber. I mean, I guess it just shows, doesn't it, how easy it can be to uh, get it wrong when you're trying to be funny about subjects, often which, as you said before, are quite are quite serious. But I think what's really interesting about this is people miss construing who the target of the joke is and there's a difference between you know and there, there could be arguments about is there anything which should be off limits to make jokes about but the target of the joke is Keir Starmer so the sort of the roots of this is that last year Keir Starmer gave an interview where he moved his position on uh, whether or not a woman could have a penis this was the the, uh, the, the question they'd been asking he, I think he previously said they could and then he uh, said in an interview that 99.9% .9 of women don't have a penis, which was seen as a change in his position. And obviously it comes alongside how he's changed his position on abolishing tuition fees or nationalising uh, industry or uh, a whole uh, range of things. And so uh, in a way to pull them all together, uh, Rishi Sunak says uh, he's counted 30 U-turns in the last year. Pensions, planning, peerages, public sector pay, tuition fees, childcare, second referendums, that's Brexit, and defining a woman. Although, in fairness, that was only 99% of a U-turn, he said. Now, clearly, the, the butt of that joke, it's not about making fun of people who are transgender. It's about making fun of Keir Starmer uh, changing his position. In the same way that if he'd have said, I don't know, I'm going to abolish tuition fees for 99.9% .9 of students. You know, it's about his u-turn it's not about the question of uh of what is uh, who is or isn't a woman or, or the transgender question you're right that what what has made this more sensitive because he's made this point before he's joked in the comments about 
you don't know what a woman is, which is, you know, a legitimate question given that Keir Starmer has, has changed position on it. What has made it more complicated is the fact that Brian Ajay's mother was in the Commons. Um, what's made it more complicated is that Keir Starmer said she was in the gallery, so Rishi Sinat would have known, although it turned out she then wasn't. She arrived a bit later. And it's all, you know, actually, to be fair, um, Keir Starmer unusually was quite quick on his feet and saw that there was a way of turning this into attack on on uh, on Rishi Sunak. I have to say, I think there is a question as to whether or not Rishi Sunak should keep using this as a line of attack, talking about who is and is not a woman, because it's a very cultural thing, which, you know, I don't think it's the, uh, a major driver for lots of people. But for those that are, sensitivity, understanding, politeness is probably better than uh, sound bites. But I do think it goes to the question of what, who is the, you know, so so you've now got other MPs standing up in the comments saying it was a transphobic joke. And I, I'm not sure it is. It's a joke about the issue of transgender. It's not a joke at the expense of Brianna Jai, her family, other people who are trans. That's not the target of the joke. I don't know what you think, Graeme. There's a, and I suppose this comes up all the time when you tell a joke, who is the butt of your joke? That's where you've got to be careful. I think you've summed it up there quite eloquently. Um, and there's a few details which you've you've just mentioned there that I wasn't aware of as well in terms of her turning up a little bit later. Um, Left-wing protagonists will say it's insensitive, it's idiotic, you know, he's inept, he shouldn't be saying things like that. But you're right, I think he's, the, he's, his anger... Is is coming across particularly towards Starmer because he's 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 obviously been tripped up week on week and he, he just sort of flipped a little bit there and he was he was throwing these you know these different theories out to him and uh, I thought Starmer deflected it quite well he used the word shame which it, it's tit for tat but I don't think it's transphobic if if that makes perfect sense um, I just think it was misplaced and possibly something he he didn't really need to need to bring up it's getting a little bit tit for tat now and point scoring there's no sort of real conviction in any of the in any of the theories or policies at the moment it's just becoming playground humor and I, I can flip that around and say for me that is quite good to be honest because I've got a lot of ammunition now um with the transphobia stuff I would probably steer well clear because you just don't know who you're going to upset and it, it's a it's quite a, a, a taboo subject so we would me and Rob would sort of discuss that and work out a plan to to steer well clear. Um, also with with possible racism issues as well. It's we tend to go for quite quite mild mild humour, childish humour, a little bit provocative, <laughs> but nothing too uh, over the border, so to speak. It's also that thing of whether you're writing a column or you know doing a bit on the radio drawing a cartoon or doing some, you know, stand-up. It's like, what do you want to say? Have you worked, you know, and actually the small, the, the tight of the frame, whether that's a one-liner joke, is it a tweet, is it a cartoon? You know, it, it, you're painting in quite primary colours to, to you know, you, you mix metaphors. And so you um, you have to be very clear what it is you're trying to say and nuance, balance, um, uh, self doubt and consideration is a very hard thing to do with humour, and so you know the trans issue is both complicated, nuanced, um, sensitive, and you may want to say something strong on it, but I think it's very difficult to do that with a with a joke, if you like, which is about the issue itself. So I can see totally why you wouldn't try and do a. Uh, you know, it, it's much easier, I suppose, to do a cartoon that sums up Vichy Sunak's made a right mess this week than uh, I've solved the trans problem because that's a really complicated, you know, health, social, legal, political question, which you're probably not going to be able to solve. Uh, and like you said, you'll end up, in, you know, when your intention is to, you'll end up upsetting people who, who aren't the target of the, of the, um, of the of the issue, yeah. Well, you you know what social media is like now. There's there's people constantly ready for a pile on. Whether you're a, you're a politician, a journalist, a cartoonist, there's always a, a faction of people waiting to pounce. And 
you've just got to be savvy and, and, and aware of that. And I always think if if you're going to really, really vilify someone and personally attack them, it's got to be justified. There has to be a a, a main reason for, for you doing that. Um, obviously, we've seen politicians be completely idiotic. In situations like that, I think you can go for them. But where we're talking about this issue now with Sunak in, in Commons today, then it's a little bit risky to to, to go out all attack for, for this. Um, but there are there are other avenues to explore. Talk, talking about social media. So when this happened, join PMQs. And on my show, we do a thing called PMQs Unpacked, where we take the first question and answer and then we pause it and we'll analyse it essentially in real time, almost like a sort of football commentary on. That was a clever question by Keir Starmer. Rishi Sunak's not really answered that. You can see there the attack lines that the Labour Party are trying out. And so that hopefully it sort of all unfolds rather than sort of washing over. You can sort of see this is the argument that Starmer's trying to, trying to mount. This is Labour's, you know, the Tory counterattack and so on. And what was interesting was because, to be honest, in the heat, the moment of the thing that Sunak said, we didn't p- pick up particularly on the sensitivity of the fact that Brian Jai's mother was there. And then obviously as soon as Starmer reacted, we did, and we talked about it for about the next half three quarters of an hour on the radio. But the people were so immediately cross, you know, people still accusing us now, like two or three hours later, of glossing over it. It's like, well, we talked about nothing else for the next half an hour. But um, the rush to think the worst of people, I suppose that's all, that, that is essentially social media summed up, uh, and ill intent rather than... Uh, recognising, well, they're a bit slow to it, but, you know, they, they got to the end, they analysed it and weighed it up. No, no, no. Um, I suppose that is just social media all over. Yeah, there's a lot of bad faith uh, with actors on, um, on on social media, aren't they? Who just want to do people down without waiting for the evidence. Um, why don't we have a think about what we could do for this week's uh, cartoon? And I know, uh, so we're not going to do that story for all the reasons we've discussed, but, um, Graham, you... We're thinking about doing something on the so-called popular conservatism movement, a new faction which has launched at Westminster this week. Just tell us what you tell us what you had in mind. Right, a couple of days prior to that, obviously that the talking point was a thousand pound bet on the Rwanda bill with Piers Morgan. That was a good that was a good bet. Um, but the popcorn movement has now emerged, and I think that that takes precedence really. Um, obviously, trust. Anderson, Rhys Mogg are all back on the scene, um, trying to restore some democratic accountability, apparently, and deliver popular conservative policies, whatever that means. But in in, in my my view, I think it's sort of some sort of far right nonsense, really. And they they like they're sort of hanging around like a like a bad smell. Um, they remind me of a bit of a a zombie parliament just re-emerging, almost like a, a return of the the living dead. And that was my initial thought. You have these sort of crazy, crazy thought processes and, and little visions in your head. And I envisage some sort of zombie style graveyard with Truss, Anderson and Mog, who are fantastic characters in themselves, um, emerging from the ground or peering from behind a gravestone, um, back and ready to party again. Obviously, the, the, the popcorn is... Uh, is there a joke about pop, pop, popcorn and and popcorn yeah, in the cinema as well. Again, it lends its it's got a cinematic flavour to it with, with popcorn, popcorn. So I could possibly picture them as three zombies handing out popcorn outside the cinema, trying to get people to come in and watch the film or you know, something along them lines. Um but that that's the sort of vision I have initially and then obviously I'll sit down with Rob and we'll sketch a few ideas out and we'll we'll refine it to a point where we're happy uh, for me to just proceed with the with the original artwork, always good fun. You know, it's great fun. What have you? What What did you make of the the pop popcorn launch uh, this week, Matt? Was we we? Do you think it's a powerful new 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 force in Westminster? No, you've gone mad, Rob. Um, no. Uh, so I mean, my favourite bit about popular conservatism is that in the run up to it, it became less and less popular before the launch. So Simon Clark, who was the uh, MP, the former minister who called for Rishi Sunak to go, was uninvited from uh, PopCon. Um, he found out via Twitter, after a journalist tweeted, tweeted that he was no longer invited. That's how he found out. There's something about Liz Truss and Twitter, because she did the same thing to Kwasi Kwarteng. He found out he was going to be sacked as Chancellor after Steve Swinford, my colleague at the Times, 
tweeted it. Uh, and then Ranul Jaiwadina, another former cabinet minister and ally of Liz Truss, announced he wasn't going to PopCon. So they ended up having to wheel out a couple of Tory candidates, not even MPs yet, uh, to sort of bolster the numbers. Um, so you ended up with, yeah, Liz Truss, Jacob Rees-Mogg and Lee Anderson. My other favourite thing, and I've been sort of slightly toying with, I almost wrote about PopCon last week in my Saturday column at the Times, think because there's always this temptation to get ahead of something uh, in your column. I thought, actually, I want to wait for it to play out. So I wrote about how I'd done the Rishi Sunak fast for 36 hours and then discovered he eats apples and nuts while he's doing it, um, which I was very cross about. But my, So the thing I'm, I'm toying with around, around PopCon is, um, in America, there's this huge thing about Taylor Swift and her role in the election... And is she the, the mad Republicans thinking she's part of some Pentagon psyops thing? Uh, but will she uh, turn up to the Super Bowl because her boyfriend's playing and they're like this massive celebrity couple? And would she back publicly back Biden? And what role would that play in the campaign? And we've had our own version of that this week at PopCon because Holly Valance from Neighbours and behind the huge hit Kiss Kiss backed backed J uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg to become Prime Minister. So on the one hand, they've got Taylor Swift and Joe Biden. We've got Holly Valance and Jacob Rees-Mogg. So I think uh, there's, there's that, that it feels like there's something there in a column about our sort of quite low-rent version of American politics. Yeah, it's very much a cut price, cut price version of, of Taylor Swift, isn't it? Uh, that, that's, uh, that's, yeah, that's really great. So, um, so Graham, you, I guess, um, you know, what your the idea you're 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 pushing there about the you know the night of the living dead suggesting that you know this wing of the conservative party is is you know already uh devoid of life for the re you know and and you know, the, the launch of popcorn was struggling before it even got going so I, I guess it would make sense to portray those involved as zombies and if they're handing out popcorn and it's popcorn i guess that would work that would work quite well wouldn't it i think so but uh, Matt's just mentioned neighbours there. Obviously, Holly Valance. So, I, <laughs> there's there's a neighbours theme as well to this as well now. So you could obviously look look at the soap opera itself. Um, but I still I still I'll still think that we should uh, steer towards the the cinematic feel, handing out the popcorn. And, I, think, I think you're probably right, Graham. I, I, you are a brilliant artist, but your ability to capture Holly Valance in a way that makes her instantly recognisable beyond putting a sign on her to say, do you remember Holly Valance? It might, you know, you, you might might require a bit more work, but your other characters, your Lee Anderson, Jacob Weiss, Mogley's Trust, are at least immediately recognisable with, with Nigel Farage lurking up in the background. Yeah, we do sometimes have to, uh, when we're portraying politicians who are not as well known or as well recognised, you have to find a way of letting people know who they are like maybe they're wearing a badge that says their name on it or something like that just just in case people look at the cartoon and think who's who's that which can be a bit yeah and a bit I, do, I do the same thing I do the same thing in my um stand-up show I have a powerpoint in part to, just so I can put up photos to say this is Andrew Bridgen this is Lee Anderson or whatever so that people aren't when I'm talking about them sat there thinking oh do I, do I know who that is I don't know who that is uh, so putting up their photos, putting up in quite big words, stupid things that they've said. Uh, it just means that the, the audience is with you the whole time rather than you losing the joke because they're trying to work out who it is you're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Our, our, producer Dan has, um, our producer Dan has chipped in with an idea. Could we have a, a voter watching the zombie movie, eating popcorn and accidentally finding Reese Mogg's eye or a finger or Liz Truss's finger? In, uh, in 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 his snack as, he's, as, as they're eating, it's a, a gruesome, a gruesome detail. <laughs> that is disgusting, isn't it? I'll, I'll I'll put out a couple of other alternative ideas. I know Graham mentioned the um, the bet, Bishi uh, Sunak's ill-advised uh, bet that he seemed to reluctantly agree to with Piers Morgan that uh, no, no that the Rwanda flights would never successfully fly anyone out. To Rwanda, and would could that be a hook to do a sort of Westminster casino type uh, type cartoon? Maybe with Sunak going going all in on his on his his poor hand of uh, with the Rwanda deal. Maybe uh, Kwasi Kwarteng 
he he's a busted flush. He's being he's being ejected from the casino, and maybe Keir Starmer is uh, being typically uh, typically cautious. He's sitting on a he's got a big twenty eight billion pile of of chips next to him, representing the uh, the green fund that he hasn't quite decided whether he's going to use yet, and he's he, he can't decide whether to stick or twist, or maybe he's going to do an each way an each way bet. Do you think that do you think that could work, Graham? Yeah, well, we we sort of had that idea initially where we did we we're going to do a split cartoon, three three individual characters. Um, so we've obviously got Rishi all in, Starmer, I'm unsure because he always is unsure, and then we've got Quasi, I'm definitely out because he's, he's he's obviously bankrupted the economy. So that that could work in terms of its simplicity. I think just three simple characters with three simple speech bubbles in a nice sort of roulette style setting. Um, but that's that, that at the moment, I think that story might have drifted now. That's the thing. You just, when we, when we look at stories throughout the week, by the time it comes to publication on a Friday and in print titles over the weekend, the Rwanda bet, for instance, may have fallen by the wayside in terms of what's newsworthy. Um, I, I don't think the popcorn story is going to disappear too quickly. I think we'll see that in the next week, two weeks, three weeks, they're going to emerge as, as well, they're going to try and emerge as more vocal and, and uh, strong characters, but I don't see it happening, but I don't think they'll be out of the limelight. So I would say, I would say the popcorn is my favourite, but I'm happy to draw whatever, you know, I, I always am, so. Yeah. What, 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 what do you think, Matt? What's got the longest lasting impact? Pop, popcorn or Vichy's ill-advised bets at the casino. <laughs> the bet. It's interesting to point the grey back because I have the same thing that if like something happens on a Monday or a Tuesday, I often think, oh, it's annoying because it will sort of be done to death by the end of the week by either cartoonists or either columnists or even sort of like Twitter. I've done if I got news for you a couple of times and there is always this sort of slight fear that on some topics the material will be just done to death before... Uh, you know, before you get to it on a sort of on a on a Friday night, so you sort of try to find new angles, I suppose, or bring new stuff into it. Um, so I, I mean, I'm finding that you know, I'm in the process of writing my stand-up show at the moment, and quite a lot of it I've tried to sort of bomb-proof by making it about previous elections or because it's called poll dancers, it's about elections and polls and stuff. So previous elections and polls, which are funny, so I can sort of build big chunks around it, so that then the topical stuff can come in later. And if I was, you know, if I was doing a show this week i'd probably try and do a bet something on the bet and popcorn but the shows in the fortnight you'd probably still have some liz trust in it but the bet might have drifted out and it's just it's a weird thing you could just sort of feel this still in the zeitgeist has this taken hold uh in a way um i suppose the other thing which would sometimes put me off is like the bet is currently being used loads by the labor party in online ads and you don't want to end up doing something which has become a party political ad. I mean, even though, you know, what you're doing, if you're attacking the Tories, you'll always be told, oh, you're a Labour supporter. If you attack the Labour Party, oh, it's typical Tory. Um, but you don't want to like ape something which has being, become an actual, you know, party political broadcast. So continuing on the theme of, uh, of you know, different different parties, I guess we're, we're looking in the not too distant future of a prospect of a Prime Minister Keir Starmer and a Labour government, from a point of view of someone who wants to be funny about politics, does that prospect fill you with fill you with dread? Do you think politics could get quite dull, Matt, when uh, when uh, under Starmer, if that does indeed happen? Um, I think the the prospect of a new cast of characters uh, will be refreshing, and I think because. The last two or three years have been so dire for the Tories and they're on, what, 20 percent of the polls. And it's sort of irresistible to point out that it's all, you know, you do end up sort of because I'm I'm not someone who tells people how to vote. I'm not, you know, I'm not partisan. You know, some columnists are that they're you know quite clearly Labour supporters or Tory supporters or whatever. That's just not my thing. You know, my my brief for my Saturday column in particular is to just be funny. And I sort of consciously make sure that. You know, it, it probably leans more towards doing Tory stuff because they are currently the government, but I'll do Labour stuff, do my obligatory Lib Dem one every so often, or the SNP or whatever. Um, but the idea of having a new cast of characters, I mean, Keir Starmer, although quite a dry man, 
is not averse to being inadvertently funny, which actually is more useful than Boris Johnson, who is genuinely funny. Um, you know, and if Boris Johnson's telling great jokes, that's not of much use to me. Whereas Keir Starmer going on about his dad being a toolmaker and growing up in a semi-detached, uh, pebble-dashed house like that, some terrible. I was, um, I was going back over some of the stuff I'd written before about him in his pe- pebble-dashed semi, and uh, I got off the train. I was walking home, and I suddenly realised I live in a pebble-dashed semi, and it never occurred to me before. And it's not even the top; it's, it's not even the whole house. The, the downstairs is red brick, and it's so it's a it's a semi-pebble-dashed semi. Uh, and I was thinking, well, one day maybe I could pull myself up out of this hovel and rise up to the level of Keir Starmer. But he's, so his 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 weird manner, his you know flip flopping, which he gets criticised for, his not really speaking like a normal person. And then around him, you've got you know Rachel Reeves and Angela Rayner and uh, um, you know David Lammy. They're all prone to occasionally putting their foot in it or whatever, and the pressure of being in government will mean that that will happen, that the, you know, their ideas coming into contact with reality, plus whatever goes on in the Tory party, whatever's left of the Tory party, if the polls are right and the Tories uh, do lose, what they do next, do they drift off into popcorn land or do they get their act together more, more quickly? Do we continue the half century pattern in the UK of a long period of one party and then a long period of the other? Um, that will all just be fascinating. But I think actually a, a refresh, I've had enough lettuce jokes now, to be honest. So I think a, re- a refresh of the uh, of the of the cast list will be quite welcome. Fantastic. Well, you've given us a flavour, Matt, of your pole dancer tour, which uh, I've got the dates in front of me, at least the northern dates. You are coming to Salford on March the 3rd, I think, and Chorley, uh, obviously well chosen, is uh, March the 18th um and so yeah people tickets still available presumably for those yes yeah i think so a couple of them have sold out but not the northern ones so uh yeah mattsholly.com's got all the uh all the details yeah and i love um actually it's, it's nice because the last time i came to salford they put me in a small room and now i'm in a much bigger room so that, i think there are plenty of tickets there and i love going to chorley obviously partly because um my name is matt Chorley, but it's also it's a great theater in chorley and the people there seem to really enjoy it so i think it's the is it the second or the third time I've been there? Anyway, it'll be great. I'm really looking forward to going back. Superb. And um, Graham, I have been considering it, and I think Popcorn, Night of the Living Dead, Truss v Smog, Zombies, Handing Out Popcorn, that is the way to go for this week's uh, this week's cartoon. So uh, I'm excited excited to see what you come up with, and I think our readers, readers will be on a... Uh, on Friday at midday as well. So uh, yeah, good good to have the chat. And um, Matt Chorley, Graham Bandera, thank you for joining me for this week's Northern Agenda podcast. Cheers, Rob. Thank you very much.